tell you when we are live. Great. Let me go to my, okay, make sure I can see it. I'm seeing it, but I don't see the video playing. Let me just double check. Okay, cool. We are live. I'm gonna go ahead and Yay. All right. So I'm I'm really excited for today's call. Um, I'm here with Dr. Saida, and uh, she is now a close friend of mine. And uh, and I'll just give a little bit of preframe before we jump into this. Um, yes. I've been recently posting a lot about porn and how I've essentially said goodbye to my mistress porn. And I'm a big advocate. If I'm going to advocate for removing porn, that we replace it. And I'm a big advocate for healthy sex and having a really good relationship and lots of intimacy and having really good, playful, exploratory, fun, um, expansive um, sex with your partner and your exploration. So I wanted to jump into this conversation today. We were having some offline conversations and we thought this would just be a really relevant conversation. And I thought my community could get a lot of value um, mm -hmm. from understanding the conversation and some thoughts from um, Dr. Saida and some of our offline conversations. So just wanted to bring this to our community. So thanks so much for joining me for this fun, juicy conversation today. Oh my God, I'm so happy to be here, Joshua. I think the the topic that we've been kind of you know, playing around with a little bit has uh, definitely turned me on. I hope that it serves everyone who's watching. Um, and one of the, I think how it started is in a casual conversation, I said something, you said something about safe, being safe, a safe man creating safety. And I was like, well, actually I create my own safety and I or opened up a whole can of whatever. And then we went into the, the need for nurturing. So I'd love, you know, to bring that into the conversation. And then what I realized as we were doing that is yes, that, of course that, but we're leaving out a whole other aspect of the conversation. So I would love to address the need for safety and nurturing in intimacy, how that also can kill Eros and what we can do about it and, and where we can um, become a little bit more, say, erotically individuated and just improve upon um, our own self-responsibility, but then also what we bring to uh, a sexual relationship. Yes, love all this. And stick around if you're watching, because we are going to get to uh, the conversation of sex and some really good topics around <laughs> it. And uh, I think this is really help, uh, helpful to address, because if you look at the Got Gottman Institute, I think their number one thing of men, the challenges men have is not enough sex. And the number one with women is not enough intimacy. So we're going to explore what's kind of going on beneath the hood, underneath that, mm -hmm. in areas that both partners need more of, and ways both partners can take more self-responsibility. Um, to getting their needs met and having the, the goals and the needs that they're wanting to meet. So we're going to get to the juicy stuff. And I think the whole conversation will be juicy. So super fun. So um, maybe let's start out around uh, that conversation initially. I, I see this just a lot of times in my, and again, I have more of a men's conversation. So I love this dialogue because Dr. Saida works, uh, Dr. Saida works with a lot of women and, and helping women get turned on and turn their bodies on. And so I think it'll be really helpful understanding masculine perspective and the feminine perspective um, yes. from this lens. So let's start first where people can really probably relate to this conversation and what they may be experiencing in their own relationships or with self. So I hear a lot on the masculine side of the challenges of one common theme is um, the feminine is, all, and again, this is probably going to be more masculine, feminine related in general, a man and a woman, uh, but um, always needing more, like it's never safe enough is one of the common themes. Men here is like, it's never quite safe enough could be one of those. Another is like, don't really know if the partner, like partner doesn't communicate anything. So the masculine doesn't really know, like, am I hitting the mark? Am I not hitting the mark? Um, I think another common challenge is a lot of, a lot of times a man will hear they're the, the partner's ready whenever, but there's no real initiation and, and, or feeling desired. Do, am I desired by my partner? Does my partner actually want to have sex with me? They'll do it whenever, but if I don't initiate it, it never happens is another common thing. So I think these are just things that we're going to tie into the conversation, but that's yeah. a lot of what I see on the masculine side of those conversations. I really love that and make sure we do cover that because that's going to be really juicy. 
And, um, and so let's start with the safety thing, because I also hear it a lot on my end. And so first, let's frame uh, that we're not here to, to say that we have the answers. Right. That, that, that the reason I love talking to you, Joshua, is that we're exploring. And it's, a, it's dynamic. And that, that's super fun for me. And so for anyone who's watching this, don't look at this as this is the hard, fast truth. Look at this as um, a journey into attempting to understand a part of human nature that's not that easy to understand. And actually, depending on the study, is depends on the lens. So the person who constructs the study determines the, the outcome. So most studies are not even constructed around, say, what would a healthy, vibrant, sexual woman who's like individuated actually express herself. We're looking at a lot of times people who are in trauma, people who've, who've, you know, of course there's many of us that have this experience, but we're not, sometimes it's like, uh, I think you can relate to this. It's like looking at what's the human potential of the physical form and never looking at an athlete, but looking at a couch potato. Mm -hmm. Right. So you're just not getting a, a good idea. You're like, well, I guess we're kind of soft and squishy here and I have pain here. And then, you know, I, I can barely catch my breath here. And that's that's what it looks like. I'm like, no, that's actually not what it looks like. So we have to almost um, understand that almost every study that's currently out there only looks at a, a certain type of population. And it's because the researchers themselves only have a certain type of lens. So it's not always an accurate read on what's the possibility, what's the potential. And that's a little bit what I want to go into today is what is the potentiality if we explore this in a, in a deeper way. I love it. And I'd also say we have a no filter uh, conversation. So uh, we both don't have filters here. So be warned. You've been warned. Uh, we're both just going to get into whatever shows up and we're both honestly radically expressive about what comes up real time. So I have no filter. I know you don't have a filter. That's what another reason this is super fun because we're exploring topics and we've done a lot of work to become really comfortable in what many times may be uncomfortable conversations or shameful conversations. And I find the more you embrace it and, and, you know, embody those dark aspects, the more we make peace with them and the less shame there is. It just more is matter of fact. So uh, we're, we may dive into some topics. You may feel like, wow, they just went there. And yes, so <laughs> be warned. <laughs> okay, great. So let's look for briefly at the issue of uh, safety. Now there is a, uh, a place for that, but I'm going to say for everyone, because I've also heard that from the masculine, from, from men uh, not feeling safe. I've had lovers who who've literally been abused on a sexual level um, by women. So we don't address that in society. We don't look at that. Like we just think men want it all the time. They're gonna be you know, ready all the time and they should give it to me all the time. And I have had men share with me that they've been beaten by their female partner because they were unwilling to have sex with them. So safety is not just you know on the side of women. However, because we tend to be the smaller bodied person. We tend to be a little bit more agreeable. We tend to maybe not vocalize boundaries as clearly, et cetera, et cetera. Then, you know, and also how we're oriented socially uh, and all the sexual violence that is in the world and all the trauma that is in the world, of course, then safety, it makes sense. If a, um, a mammal isn't feeling safe, anything sexual that is like a system in the body goes offline, completely goes offline. So, of course, then uh, some degree of stabilizing the nervous system, the hormonal system through at least just looking like, OK, I think I'm physically safe right now. Nothing's going to harm me. Then we can start accessing a little bit more the pleasure systems of the body. So I think safety is a valid request. I also think it can be a limiting request. So I'm just going to stop here for a moment. Yeah. And I do a lot of work around nervous systems. So I completely support that is um, when we're in a sympathetic state, um, literally we can't, we're not reproducing because we're fighting for survival. And yes. when we're in a parasympathetic state, reg what I call regulated versus activated, regulated is one of the common things is feed and breathe, rest and digest. So it's actually, uh, and it can be very transparent when men are in a sympathetic, they can release, but they have problems getting erections. When they're in a parasympathetic, they actually are able to get erections because they're more relaxed. And at least what I've heard in the, in a, in a, in the feminine and a woman 
is that's when she gets, she gets wet is when she's in a relaxed parasympathetic state versus when she's not, that doesn't happen. So just as a, another cue, if you're constantly in a state of survival or unsafe, that may be a problem why it's not working. So there's a very real conversation, both physiologically in the body and emotionally, I'd say with feeling safe. So we're, we're validating the need for safety. And I think the other area you're talking about is some people can use that as a story because they have felt unsafe in the past and then, or there's been something that made us feel unsafe about a partner. And then we get attached onto that story of feeling unsafe. And there's never a route, like you can never actually get safe. If, if you, if you move a little bit into, I'm a victim and this is where it gets a little tricky. There's a very real need for safety. And how do you take some responsibility to make sure that you can claim your own safety? Um, if yeah. you're not feeling safe on both, on both sides. Yes. So this is where the journey of erotic individuation is very important. And we, you know, we mature physically. We're like, okay, we expect a baby body to become an adult body to a degree. We expect mentally like through going to school and getting educated that we will grow on a mental level. Um, We may even have some communities that mature spiritually where there's initiations in different types of spiritual belief systems, but emotionally and sexually, we're very stunted as a human race. We, we don't look at the maturity process of those things. It's very rare. We see a healthy adult expressing emotion, like healthy emotion, adult emotion, and definitely sexually. So just it's nobody's fault wherever we're at. It's like kind of like the collective soup that we're swimming in. And that gives opportunity for growth, right? So, so in terms of like, um, how do we take self-responsibility? I'm just going to give a tiny background of myself because I don't think uh, everybody knows my story, but I grew up in exceptionally violent First Nations reservations where the, my house was a shelter for abused women. Uh, abuse was happening everywhere. Murder was happening everywhere and the police wouldn't even come. So you have to understand the environment was extreme. That's where I grew up. But I, and I grew up in a, my home life was beautiful, but that was the environment. At 20, I had a violent rape experience and was told I had two weeks to live. Okay, so these are kind of like extreme background things, but I'm setting that there because I am the perfect specimen for demanding safety at all times, everywhere, right? Because if you understand the background, however, I don't. Through the process of erotically individuating, kind of taking time to get to know myself, learning self-regulation practices, learning self-cultivation practices, really questioning my belief systems, There was a moment in my progression where I realized I create my safety because I trust me. And if my instinctual uh, intuitive body is going, something's off, something's off. And then I would align myself to always respect that experience. That's something we have to relearn because often wires get crossed when we're quite young. So that relearning, however, sets us up for success, right? Because now I'm accurately reading without understanding my environment. There's something off. I respond accurately. So I can scan and know whether I'm safe very quickly because I trust the signals of my somatic um, body and my awareness. This is outside of story even because some people appear safe and yet my body's like, get the hell out of here. And it's always been accurate in that sense. Yeah. I, I really love this. I'm, I'm what's coming up is I, I have a friend specifically who when we were, we unpacked this, we were talking about it. They said, here's the context. There's a party happening at this house of a couple and the, the woman felt unsafe. And the conversation was the masculine said, I didn't feel unsafe. So, so I, this is a, a, I'm thinking of the application here. Here's a good example of, I'm curious your thoughts on this. Cause we talked about like, how do you handle this and what if you you feel safe and everything's okay, but she doesn't, do you forcibly mm-hmm. remove somebody from the, like, how do you navigate that situation? And so- I love this, yes. So i curious to, to get <laughs> your thoughts on that. Well, as I started to really love and respect the intuitive instinctual aspect, right? The, the part that we kind of try and diminish is actually really essential if safety is going to be the topic. So what would happen when that started to come integrated is I would go to parties and there would be a moment where I would feel like something is off. And my partner at the time did not feel that. Mm. What I told him is, if I say something's off, you must trust me. Mm. And we'll figure out a plan. But you, you, you cannot in that moment 
tell me that I'm wrong. That's not going to work for the system. So he learned that if I'm like, because I would literally go animal and like, I'm like, someone would come and like, no, like something's really off. My partner, like, this is really uncomfortable socially, but okay, babe. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, um, and he would check in with me, like, do you want to leave or do you want us just to shift where, like, where we are in the frame of the party? And I would then communicate that. So I, getting him to be on board with trusting my animal instincts in the end actually even benefited him business-wise because the same thing that was tracking something off in a party was also tracking something off in a business agreement. And as he learned to trust that, we became far more um, like allies on the path together. Now, because he was with me, I knew I wasn't physically unsafe because he was with me, he, he was protective of me. Nothing was actually gonna happen, but it's an energetic <clears throat> read that something isn't safe. I wasn't, nothing was gonna happen to me, but why it was important that I voiced that I didn't feel safe and for him to acknowledge that is an entrainment of going, it's okay, I'm picking something up. There's something dissonant in the environment and my partner is um, allowing that to exist and, and validating it by going, okay, babe, I don't feel it, but you feel it, so that's fine. One of us is knowing something's off. And that then created where actually I could feel more and more safe and I would distinguish where or whom that vibe might be coming from. And then either have a conversation, even confront that person in some way, just like, hey, are you okay? Or what's going on? Um, and just to kind of unpack that. But anyways, so that's kind of how I think we can as we're transitioning from always contracted, always stories to trusting our instinctual body and then trying to work in partnership. I think that's a, a, a good progression. Yeah, I, I really love this because what, I, what, I, what I'm hearing is one, acknowledge that there's a feeling of unsafe and then strategize multiple solutions that could solve it. So for example, it, could, it doesn't have to be forcibly removing and kicking somebody out necessarily from the party. It could say, Hey, can I have a conversation or two? Can I check in with them or three? Can we move to a different location and keep an eye on them? So there's strategies around it, but the acknowledgement is the big piece is, is what yes. I'm hearing. If they're acknowledgement and problem solve. Um, yes. Now let's think about just to translate this back to the sexual conversation. Um, how does this show up in sex where, you know, let's say somebody's saying, oh, I'm shutting down because I don't feel safe or I'm shutting down. And I've also seen the flip side, which I know after we talk to nurture, I want to full circle it. Yes, yes. Uh, where a woman will say, hey, I don't quite feel comfortable. I don't feel safe. Or I've heard the masculine say, I've traded so much safety. I'm not attracted anymore. And so there's these two different sides, which I think are really Absolutely. interesting. Absolutely. So there's a couple of things that we can look at here. The first is, as you heard my story, and as I um, had a victimized experience, I don't never consider myself a victim of rape, but I had a victimized experience. So this is a very strong distinction because I don't form my identity around that one moment in time. Um, this is really crucial uh, if we are gonna step into sovereignty and actually heal. It's important to say, yes, this happened. It is not essentially who I am. Okay, so that's like a really big deal because once we make that shift, then we can start taking responsibility and going, how is it that I would love to live moving forward? Yes, that happened, but what's needed now in order to heal and grow and deal with the trauma and, and all of that? So, so is it fair to say if somebody has the identity, this is me, that's when the story loops? Yeah, so if, that uh, will always be front and center. Is that what I'm hearing from you? It's like, for example, if the story is I'm, this happened to me, and then when's it going to happen? I'm waiting for it to happen again is the pre um, versus this thing happened. How do I want to, is that the distinct, the distinction? Yes. It's not always uh, possible for someone to, to have the mental clarity initially around a, a piece of trauma. That's why we do need community and work and professionals and like all of those things. However, when we get to the stage where we can uh, look back and understand where we are and we've stabilized a bit and we can start, you're at a choice at that point. We are in a society that is exalting the victim and is exalting woundology. So in my work, it's a bit controversial because I actually believe essentially that we're all powerful. And yes, we have difficult things that happen, but when we start to identify clearly with this victim mentality, which is absolutely everywhere and it's super promoted, 
So you're actually like in if you've been a victim of something. It, it's a it's a way to be accepted and to belong to something. Um, this is hard because I'm not saying don't look at it, and I'm not saying the thing didn't happen in all of that. It did. Everyone gets victimized. This is a human experience. I don't know a single human that hasn't had a victimization experience. The identity is crucial though. So what has happened with the women that I've worked with, and especially those who've had like extreme violence, is we really worked with that moment of identity. Like, what do you want to identify with? That point in time, is that going to be who you are for the rest of your life? Yeah. Or who are you really? And, and what can we learn and grow from that particular moment in time and then move into possibility of what else is there in life? And that's really the decision I had to make when I faced my death. You know, is this, is this going to be my reality or am I actually going to um, lean into possibility and create something else? I love it. I think this, and I think this is another area we align on uh, is very similar because I do a lot with veterans and a lot of times that can happen where there's a whole victim mindset where, yes, you had this horrible, horrific thing happen, but that identity links in and then they can't get out of it. And I, so I see it in a different realm, not necessarily yeah. to sexual abuse, even though a lot of men have had sexual abuse. I just see it in that general realm of like, oh, I can't now do the work to claim ownership and to change my life because that narrative gets so pervasive. So big, yeah. big steps here is if we recognize that safety is always a thing that, that comes up for us. One, how do we get the proper support that we need to start to explore that, explore our beliefs, start to re regulate our own nervous systems and create our own safety for ourselves? And I'd say in that, learn to really honor what is unsafe and learn to communicate and change if it's not yes. safe versus to me, the old story will actually step into those, which I've done. Um, when I was in more identifying as a victim, I would step into situations to re re become a victim. Un unconsciously until I started claiming and, and communicating that. So I'd say that's how you know you start to change it, change out of it. Exactly. And so the question I always ask is this, if you're not feeling safe, take a moment right this moment, even now, like look around your room, Joshua, I'm going to look around. Are we physically safe right now in this moment? Yes. Okay. So that is being safe. I'm, I'm actually physically safe. No one's attacking me. Nothing weird's happening right now. That's being safe. It's different than feeling safe. So we could actually be safe and not feel safe. We could actually be, be not safe and feel safe, which is often when there's been abuse, the wires have been crossed. So we only feel safe in abusive situations, for example. Okay, so that uncrossing of those wires is, yes, some work we can do with professionals, but it also requires a uh, rebuilding of trust with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so that's mainly where my line of work uh, comes in. And that's where when we start to do that, we realize I'm the one that creates the experience of safety, the feeling safe comes from me because I'm going to also take care of being safe. I'm not going to physically put myself in scenarios that are unsafe, but once I'm actually safe, it's, it's my choosing to feel safe and to recognize that. So it's the alignment of what's lived, which is the being safe and what's felt, which is the feeling safe. Yeah. I, I really love this. And again, I think this is what's great. I think our work trans translates very similar because a lot of the work we're doing as men, I think is more external. Whereas I think a lot of the feminine is more internal. We're learning to claim, get safety by do my words, thoughts, and actions align. Can I trust myself? Can I create safety by saying, if I'm going to do this, can I go do this? Does my word and my actions follow my voice? Mm -hmm. And as I can start to move forward on that, I start to build more trust in myself and, yes. and shifting from those shadows of unsafety I, I see the masculine shadow of like what, what we call toxic in society um, of one side of the coin. And the other side is the guy who just appeases and, and totally surrenders. So that middle ground is the man who has claims his power. And if something doesn't feel good, he expresses it and communicates his truth or his authenticity or what we call wild man. And in that there's conflict. And in that conflict, sometimes things don't work out, but it's really um, a lot of men I see get wired on getting their value from meeting the needs of their partner and not expressing their needs at all. And um, it's even been part of the whole masculine feminine movement is there's big message like the man always leads 
the man always creates safety and goes first, which there is a, I, I do see some truth to claiming self-responsibility and giving, even if your needs aren't met. And mm -hmm. I think that can turn into um, this martyr energy where you're um, not claiming your needs and martyring forever. So I think there's a, there, there's a line here of how do you continue to express your needs and know that your needs need to be met. And again, doesn't always mean your partner can meet them. It means if the needs are there, you can meet them yourself too. But it's yeah. important that we meet our needs and don't suppress those because the suppression is what I find shows up as the shadows. Yes. Um, so if we have needs, we need to get them met. And in that ownership, whether it's communicating your sexual desires or needs, whether it's expressing what's working or not working, which can be really threatening, I think, to both the masculine and feminine. But I know there's the wounding of, I may be abandoned. I mean, I may be feel rejected or unloved if I have these desires or needs or, or wants or wanting to feel appreciated or wanting to be acknowledged. And so we suppress those. So I think that's the, if you're a man listening and wanting to be more authentic, how do you awaken yourself by expressing and know it's it maybe met with some conflict at first, or maybe met with some, exactly. uh, which, yeah. which is that danger, which the, a little bit of that danger creates some momentum and excitement and polarity and fun. So, yeah. And so I, I want to just mention a question that a coach, one of my coaches for myself had asked me at some point in, in my journey. And she basically said, what if your life isn't about being safe? That I actually remember the feeling. It was like reality went <laughs> like, it just like say what? Because I think when there's so much orientation, I need to be safe. I must be safe. That's all we, we can possibly fathom when that, when that question came in, like, what if my life is actually not about, well, what is it about then? Now I'm not going to obsess about this thing. I'm going to make sure I'm safe. I'm going to like track my intuition, my instincts. I'm going to state my boundaries and we can be playful. And as we're being playful, if something starts to feel off, I'm going to use my voice and say, hey, actually, that kind of feels off because I'm trusting myself. And then if you don't respect that, I'm like, you're not respecting me. I'm out of here. You know, so it doesn't matter to me. Like, if you, okay, it's nice if you respect it, but if you don't, I, I can leave. So there's, you know, there's a confidence in my ability to act and follow through to keeping myself quote unquote safe. So now my orientation doesn't have to be about safety. What will it be about? Hmm. And that was kind of a big shift. So I think if people are watching this and safety has become an obsessive theme just for a moment, just, just a second, considering like, what would my life, and let's be specific to this talk, what would my sex life be like if it wasn't wholly uh, oriented to safety? Mm. Mm. That's a really good question. And, and is it a protective layer from maybe what society looked at as shameful? Like may there, once you get past that question, there may be a whole nother side of intimacy and play and laughter and but it may be unpacked under somebody else's beliefs of what was shameful or what was wrong or what was bad. And so you may, that's where the digging of beliefs come from is once you start to change that pattern, what could it look like? Like, exactly. like, and what are you modeling is another really good question. Like a lot of times we get advice from people that aren't in really, you know, passionate relationships on, or people commiserate together when they're all unpassionate. So if you're mm -hmm. getting advice, are you making sure you're looking at couples, if you want a couple or lovers, who are having really passionate, intimate, fun, healthy dynamics. Um, because a lot of times I experience that is there's a lot of healthy communication around sex. There's a lot of exploration. There's a lot of let's discover this together. And there's this whole world of discovery. I think to your point, if your work, if your life isn't about safety, then you get a little bit on that danger zone in your, in your healthy dynamic. I want to make sure there's yeah. context there in a healthy dynamic, a healthy relationship where you're both communicating trust, you're wanting to meet each other's needs, then you get to explore a little bit of your, your fantasies. You get to explore a little bit of like, what well, I don't know, let's discover this. And yes. I think you said something earlier, which is really valid. What happens if there's too much safety in a relationship where you have trust, you have all the things, let's say you've even been together 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. And of course there's safety. Is there a point where you lose the passion completely because it's too safe? Yes, absolutely. Because um, the work of Esther Perel looks deeply at this, and she wrote a lot about erotic intelligence. And so the idea here, if you can imagine two pillars, and one is intimacy, which is where the safety aspect conversations come from. We want connection, 
<clears throat> we want to know a little bit about who we're connecting with and what they're about and what makes them kind of, you know, purr and, but also what maybe triggers them. Like we're, we're that's intimacy. We want to have bridged the gap between the hearts and the minds, but Eros doesn't care at all about any story, like at all. Eros, it comes alive. That's why sometimes you can feel intensely aroused by a complete stranger you know nothing about. And it's just pure instinct, like the smell of them walking by or something, or just like, I don't know, the way their nose is shaped. Who knows what triggers the, the thing? But Eros is, it's, it's this novelty. It's the freshness. It's, um, it's untamed, it's, it's wild, it sits outside of our little domesticated boxes. Mm. So let's change Eros to aliveness. The things that make us feel alive, the things that switch us on, this is actually really valuable. And so if we're, if we're doing too much safety, then the, the degree of switched onness or the degree of aliveness will kind of dampen, unless we're comfortable I used to hitchhike everywhere, Joshua. I'd literally hitchhike everywhere. And my number one question always to the driver was, are you happy? And nine out of 10 times they're like, comfortable, not happy. Hmm. Nine out of 10 people that I would ask. So there's something that we, we treasure comfort because it's not challenging, but we also feel kind of dead. Yeah, you know, just one of my own personal experiences as you're talking, I'm like, oh, like I, I see this is definitely one of the areas I've struggled with is I do a lot of work to make uh, uh, when I'm dating women, make them feel really safe. And I probably go over. And I think the most passionate relationship I had was with the woman who didn't speak. She didn't really speak that good of English. So we couldn't go really deep in all the things I'm usually really good at communicating and it was the most passionate relationship I've had. And now that you're talking, I'm like, oh, because there was arrows. It was just a instinctual thing that happened that was stronger than, and I couldn't talk. Yeah. <laughs> really simply put. So I couldn't create all these little extra safety and story and conversation to make sure somebody was extra safe. So this is really yeah. helpful to me of saying like, wow, if you're too safe, you actually kill arrows is what I'm hearing from you. So how do you, how do you be really communicative, create safety, but not so much safety that you kill arrows and that's that that power. yes and i think what we have to do is edit the word so what i mean by that is you know when you have a document and you can go find this word so let's go into the document of our sex life and we'll search the word safe or safety and then you can go replace with right so we're going to replace that word with respect because i think when i have deep respect for myself and I have deep respect for you, which essentially for me is what love is. It's profound respect for self and other. So let's change the word to respect. Now, do I respect myself enough to state my boundaries? Do I respect myself enough to, to state what's really like, kind of, I don't know, a little naughty thought that I've not explored before, but I want to say it and it maybe feels scary, but I'm, you know, do I respect myself enough to say it? Do I respect you enough to listen and really feel because sometimes you are the one that's going to need the, the quote unquote safety. Do I respect enough to like attune and notice and pay attention to, we're all very intelligent, but we don't pay attention to these cues of when a person is turning away or when a person kind of contracts or we're not really watching that. And do you know who does this very skillfully? The bonobos. The bonobos are the most sexual of, of all the beings here. They resolve all their tensions with sex. And um, so if, you, if you're having a bad day, a bonobo would come up to you and just like, can I like pleasure you? Like, that's basically like bonobo language. And what so, is bonobo? I've never even heard of bonobo. What, what is it? Okay. Like, so there's chimpanzees it? and there's bonobos. Ah, ah interesting. And the bonobos um, are actually considered like a different culture because they actually can communicate. You can teach bonobos to communicate uh, with human beings. So they're not even really considered quote unquote animals. Um, but, but in studying the bonobos in the Victorian era, they were too sexual. So they said, no, humans are like chimps because they didn't want to talk about the bonobos. Mm. Uh, but what happens in, in when two bonobos engage and uh, say the male, there's male and female engagement, the, if the female kind of looks away, she looks bored or she's not really into it, the male immediately stops. It just stops. So they're reading each other's cues that are nonverbal 
And so if we have respect, I have respect for myself. I'm tracking myself. I can feel what's going on. I also have connection to you. So I'm extending that respect and I'm also tracking you. When we dance in that dance, it's a lot easier to actually feel safe without using the word safe. And it's a lot easier to advocate for the things that we need it, rather than using the orientation of safety. Like, here's what I'd love. Like, if this is cared for, I can go wild, right? So there's just a knowing of oneself. And then there's room to respond to something emerging that might surprise both or all if there's more than two, right? So having the ability to know oneself, to deeply respect oneself, I think is what can start transforming the safety talk into something that becomes dynamic and beautiful and intimate and sexy. Mm, I love all this. And, it, and it's going to require the courage of communication, uh, mm -hmm. you know, on both sides um, or being super attuned and present and, and actually giving bodily language to, to communicate yeah. to your partner. Uh, yeah. In flipping to nurture, because when we were talking about this, a lot of times the common thing we hear with women is safety, majority of the time. And then the common thing that we hear with men, and I would say it's, we don't always hear nurture, but I'd say that's what's going on under the hood. A lot of times we hear sex or we hear a hug or we hear like, I, I need some sort of communication or I want to hear, I love you, or I'm attracted to you or some sort of, to me, that's the energy earlier when somebody says, I want to be pursued. I don't necessarily means that a man necessarily wants his partner hunting him down and like <laughs> directing it. He just wants to know, do you find me attractive? Do you love me? Do you, uh, are you turned on by me? Are you, uh, am I, do I do it? So for me, the nurture is really what we're looking for is, ah, am I, am I either, when I'd say nurture kind of has two sides, it's either that sexual component or the actually deep nurture, like uh, that only the feminine can give the masculine. We can give it to ourselves, but not at the same level that we learn from, let's say our mothers or raising up at a young, at a young child. So um, I really want to, and I'm curious on the feminine side, how do you see this? Cause I know with you, you tend to have a really openness um, when it comes to nurture and your sexuality, what's your experience on the feminine when they tend to have resistance? Cause that's one of my experiences is I noticed there's a, there's a wall that can kind of come up either um, there's a, a, a negative association on the sexual side, kind of like, nope, no go zone. Um, and it could either be, I've heard a lot of women say, once they go through menopause, once they have a child, like something can actually happen in the body that shuts down that or doesn't, isn't mm -hmm. the same way or brings up some insecurities or the nurture. I've heard a lot, like I'm not a mother. And so when there's a, a need to feel the nurture, there's a shutdown, like I'm not a mother, I'm not going to baby a man. So curious on the feminine side, at least that's, I'd say through the masculine lens of how it's interpreted curious on the feminine side, the flip side of that, or your perspective on that. Yeah, I, I think it's both. And I think that many people love to give and they love to care for and they love to quote unquote nurture, you know, they might do that through making food or they might do that through folding laundry or they might do that through massaging your feet like there's many different ways in which this can show up. So first of all, it's like, well, what does it look like if, you, if you're needing to be nurtured like, and I'm making you all this food, but really you're saying I want you to like, you know, caress my whole body. That's a whole other like Mm. I should stop cooking then and we're going to shift to like something, right? So, so we have to, just as for safety issues, we need to start to understand what is it actually that I need in order to open. Um, with nurture, it's the same. It's like, well, what do you need to like relax? You know, what is it that you need to open? Also open, but it's more like an openness of body and a relaxation of the heart. And, and we don't know that. We don't know ourselves. So, and I also think we're all men and women alike, terrible at actually nurturing ourselves. Agreed. We're very abusive towards ourselves. We're very cruel and demanding and self-loathing and self-critical. So sometimes when it's asked of a person who they themselves isn't giving it to themselves, mm -hmm. they don't even know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there can be so much identity like you know, you need to keep me safe is the one thing, but you need to always nurture me. It's like, I don't want to be your mother. I want to be your lover. That is a very common thing I hear that women say. I've even said it very, very like, you know, quite a few times in different relationships. So what is it that I'm saying or we're saying when we're saying, I don't want to be your mother? It's not that I don't want to love you. I don't want to care for you. I don't want to like, you know, adore you. 
is that when you are expecting it and you feel like an empty hole and I ha- that's the only thing I'm good for is to somehow pour this into you. It's pouring endlessly and there, it's not really coming back in, in hotness or, you know, you're not looking at me the way you look at the, the strange hot chick walking by. You look like you want to eat her with me. You're just like wanting to suck the tit, you know, um, you be breastfed. That's not exciting to, to a woman. That's where all the threatening kind of stuff can come in. And then I think that there's also the Madonna whore complex that really affects people. So you like the girl as the wild one when she's not yours, but the second she's yours, you need her to be like different. And that is difficult already in the female psyche to contend with that she's both and neither at the same time. So it's, it's a big conversation. I do think everybody needs to learn. Again, that's where individuation comes from. That's where self-care comes from, self-respect comes from. And then also clarity of, well, what does it look like? Yeah, and it's, I love this because as we're talking about it, I see so many parallels on both those sides of it because I see the same, a lot of times the masculine's like, oh, I, I keep showing up and it's never quite enough, which is that empty, that same context. Like I keep giving and it's never enough. When's it enough? Or I think, I think there's also something I, I constantly share is on the masculine. I think a lot of times we're seen like these big, strong, powerful creatures. And a lot of times we're like super sensitive under the hood, but it's not strong and masculine to acknowledge that. So a lot of times we have a really hard time saying like, Hey, I need to feel desired or I need to feel loved or okay. I need to feel nurtured. So I think that gets, it almost feels humiliating on the masculine side to be like, wow, I'm with the partner of that. And I think that's where it gets a little tricky and it may be similar to the feminine, if you're out in the world and you see people giving you acknowledgement, but at home, you're not getting any of it. That's mm-hmm. where it starts to feel like, ah, I'm giving, I'm giving, I'm giving, and I'm not seeing, which I think yeah. goes back to that lens. Can I see myself? Am I able to see myself and acknowledge myself and self-respect myself? Or am I needing somebody to do it for me? Mm-hmm. Which is this, one of the things we talk about in K4 is this, the adolescent looks for external validation versus the adult looks for service. And again, both of these can have a shadow, right? The, uh, yeah. the adolescent can constantly feel the need for um, filling that self up and it never is enough, but you can move to service and be a martyr through service. So there's these tricky, <laughs> tricky yeah. lines, but I think in general, how do we fill ourselves up is the metaphor. How do we notice when we're needing something from somebody else? And mm-hmm. there's a, one of my, my friends, Brian, and he may have gotten this somewhere. Um, Brian Reeves told me, there's the codependency to independence to interdependence of these three different levels. Yes. yes. And um, I think a lot of us are in the codependency. We're like, I give this to you and then you give it back to me. And so we're, we're horse. I make a bargain. Huh? I make a bargain. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a, it's like a trade. And then we're constantly doing expecting. And then the next stage is how do we move to independence, which is I got me and you got you, which it could be a hard phase if we're yeah. enmeshed. Um, and then the third phase is, interdependence. I got me, you got you, but I hear what you need. And if I can give you what you need and not hurt my needs, I'm happy to give it. Right. Is that, I think the evolution. I I describe it in a slightly simpler way. Maybe um, one is the beggar's bowl where we expect others to complete, like always complete that and fill that. And we're kind of a beggar. Like we think like, if I don't get this from this person, I'm, I'm going to lose my mind or I'm going to go, you know, whatever. And then there's the gourmet plate and the gourmet plate. You don't bargain. I have this delicious plate. It's like, I'm enjoying it so much and I'm offering it to you, but there's no, um, there's no like covert contracts. It's just, here's this gourmet plate. I'm loving it. Oh, you don't want it. That's fine. I'm really enjoying it. But it's not like I'm going to give you this so I can get that. Okay. So it's gourmet plates are only developed through solo cultivation. They cannot be developed any other way. You, it's, it's the wealth of your own deep respect and connection. And that's what you're offering another. And again, I think to solve this nurturing thing, it comes back down to deep respect of yourself, like knowing of yourself and respecting another enough to be able to say, I get that you need this at this moment, I don't have it in me to give you at this moment. Can we meet in a couple hours? I'll have a little bit more time then and actually more, uh, let's do that. Like being able to actually honestly engage and have that enough of a respectful. And I just don't see that uh, happening very much. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I agree. I think, you know, and this is what we're moving into, like, how do we solve this? If you can find yourself listening, going, oh, wow, we do all these things, or I do all these things in my 
lover or partnerships, like what's the way out? So one, I'd say big picture, noticing when you're desiring or needing something to fill that, that bowl up. It's a mm -hmm. great example of when you're in an activated place. How do you self-regulate? How do you learn self-regulation tools to regulate your nervous system? Again, back to the conversation, how do we create safety and self-nurture, self-respect mm -hmm. for ourselves so we can get regulated once we do? How do we communicate really clearly our needs and also be okay if our partner's not able to meet them? Um, yeah. That's another valid conversation. Somebody may desire once you awaken and learn your body, if you haven't been like, wow, this is a core need of mine and somebody else may not be able to meet it. And then you got to assess like, as long as you're both in your truth, I think that's what you start to find this alignment in of like, wow, okay, we, we still love each other deeply and we're expressing needs. And sometimes the needs match, sometimes they don't, and we can still make it. Other times mm -hmm. you might find, well, you know what, this doesn't work for me anymore. I'm, we're totally different people. Now that I'm not trying to fill my bucket up with each other's bucket in these covert contracts, you kind of pull away from that and learn to really communicate who you are and yeah. figure out what that looks like. Because I see some couples or some men that'll do the work trying to make a relationship work. And then they're like, wait a second, I'm not, this isn't my partner. I've been trying to become somebody to prove my worthiness when it's not even the right fit. And now that I know, Bingo. like you just find somebody else that's alignment. So, and other yeah. times, so I think that's part of this journey is in the getting back to our initial conversation, keys to having really good sex. I'd say it boils down to, can you regulate yourself? Can you give yourself safety? Can you give yourself nurture? Can you get clear on who you are? Can you pleasure yourself, right? Can you do all the things with you, which can be really challenging. I know it's a really challenging experience. And if you've been, uh, to your point, living off of a bowl of trying to get filled up and then you learn, you have to redo it and you have to rebuild it. And in doing so, you start to figure out who you are and give yourself permission to communicate that. And then it gets really fun. I'd say that's when the fun journey, at least my journey has been like, wow, I have a voice, I can communicate. And you get rejected a little bit when you're, it's not the right fit. And then when you do find it, you just feel uh, more alive and um, more like, like lit up, like, wow, I'm actually seen and met at a exactly. full level versus not, you know? So what, what about you? What's your thoughts on, again, people are listening, kind of going, where, where do I, how do I even get there? Where do you know? Yeah. Do so there? definitely um, the, the first question to ask is ourselves is, would I love to live like my most optimal, fully expressed life? Is that something I would love? And if that's true, then uh, the conversation we're having is is going to be one that will serve. If not, then I don't think this conversation is going to serve the, that person um, because this is not a place where we're uh, helping victimhood and woundology thrive. This is where it starts to wilt. And then there's an invitation to erotically individuate. So what that means is we are our own primary partner. And literally I, at different stages of my development, I said to myself, I am going to see what it's like. I'm going to date myself. Like, I want, like, how interesting can I be? Like, I'm not that interested. I don't want to date myself right now. Like at the state that I was in, I'm like, oh my God, I wouldn't date me right now. But then like, how, how can I become that person that I would? And what can I give to myself to make it an exciting moment or an exciting day? Or like, what would I love that turns me on? And it's always, it can be different things. It's not always sexual. Sometimes it's just like, I love swimming in the Aegean Sea and in Greece in the summer. It's, to me, that's orgasmic. I literally have orgasm swimming. So like I go and I give that to myself. Now I'm full. So when I do meet a lover, I have something to offer because I went and I filled myself. I'm not sitting there going, I'm going to wait till he shows up and he better have energy and like be into this. And if he doesn't like, you know, all of that uh, dynamic that we have. So one being one's own best lover opens a whole vista of possibility. The great news is you're never going to leave yourself. Like you're there till the last breath. So you're the most devoted partner you will ever have. The other great news is you know exactly how to touch yourself because you're like, oh, if they would just only up, uh, right? Ooh, yeah. And then you're like, oh yeah, I'm just going to do it. Oh yeah. You know, so you can kind of get into um, really giving yourself the quality of touch and intimacy and connection and real, like just being real, looking in the mirror look in the mirror when you come look in the mirror when you're crying look in the mirror when like start to know yourself and love that which is there it's it's a beautiful beautiful being when you have that that gourmet plate starts to really flourish and when we have that gourmet plate 
It's a very different offering erotically. And even if you've been with someone for a very long time, I've, I've coached couples been together a long, long time and it was a dead sexual relationship. And now it's the best sex of their lives. Why? And one partner was resistant, wouldn't do any of the work at all. She took it on. She became her own best lover. She started to give herself exactly what she wanted when she wanted it. She confronted all her little beggar attitudes and started to blossom. And suddenly he's like, that's kind of interesting. And he started to join her. Then he became curious. So there's no need to even like put a condition like my partner has to do it or this is going nowhere. That's not always true. So yes, sometimes we do, you know, move apart, but sometimes actually we can flourish uh, with that same person. So I don't want to terrify people. With it. <laughs> like If you explore this, your current relationship is going to die. It's not always the case. Um, so that's really how I think what's inspiring to me is learning self-regulation, which is at the foundation of all my work. We self, we understand how to self-regulate through breath, through how to move the body. Uh, we look at how we define reality because definitions create reality. So we look a lot at those things. And then we have a very, very strong self-pleasuring uh, lifestyle. And I don't just mean like genitals. I mean like self-pleasuring, like just enjoying a smell, enjoying a taste. Like what can you give yourself visually, texturally to create more pleasure? Well, and I think as anybody that's listening right now, think about that as a human. If you met a human, and they were turned on by life, like excited about life, excited about what, like making decisions, making choices that lit them up and excited them and develop a strong moral compass of like who they were and ability to create safety. So, so they're not just jumping around it, but that may be their energy. Like whatever it is, is excites them. They fully own it. Is that more exciting or somebody that's kind of going through the motions, succumb to life doing like, there's a totally different energy there. And so, yeah. you know, Think of how the connection and chemistry would be if somebody's lit up. And then if yeah. you're lit up, what does that start to look like? What is possible if you have healthy communication, healthy dialogue, and maybe just to ex create some examples. Like, I think we're, like, we're feeling like, wow, what does that look like? I can see the trajectory. And just to give a couple examples, like, what do you think that may look like for somebody? Let's say there's two couples that are turned on and maybe had a sex life for five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, or new people meeting each other, what could it look like? Um, mm -hmm. I'm curious to get your perspective. I have a perspective too. I'm just curious, like what could the possibilities look like where they can kind of go, wow, I could see what this may look like. The invitation I make to everyone, I don't care where you're at in your evolution, what the state of your relationship stuff is going on. The invitation is always erotic innocence. So what I mean by that is it's invoking a curiosity. It's invoking um, an ability to, you know, just not judge something as good, bad, right, wrong, just to have it an experience. And then later you can discern going, well, that was okay. I, never doing that again. Or that was actually kind of fun. Like how else could we do more of that? You know, maybe slightly different. So erotic innocence for me, cultivating that, what that looks like, it's, it's simple. It could just be um, maybe instead of, I think with couples, sometimes we can say, oh, he's good at this and this and this, but he sucks here. So that's the, the judgment of an experience. What would happen if you let all that go? And the next time you kiss, it's both your first and your last kiss. You will, it's the first time you've ever kissed this person. It's the last time you ever get to. And when we live like that, it is so raw and beautiful and primal. And that is actually the truth. I asked my parents, cause they've been together a long time and they're still very sexual. I'm like, God, like, how do you do it? You know? And my mom says, your father's a mystery to me. Yes, I know him very well but he's a new man every single day. And that's what I get curious about. Yeah. I remember uh, when I was working for Tony Robbins, I remember he was telling a story about a couple and they were like in their late eighties and they were at one of his events and they were all over each other, like almost to the point where it was a little uncomfortable for people because they were so all over each other. And he had to stop them and said, he's like, what's your secret? And it, they looked up all excited and they were like, we, I think he said the story that they go, we try everything once. And if we like it, we do it again. And that was their model for success of why they're still so passionate. And, and I think for me, like we're sexual creatures, we're sexual beings. And what would it look like? I know for me, when I read uh, David Dieta's book a long time ago, um, over a decade ago, I remember he had the question to ask yourself as a man, am I a 
you know, naturally polygamous or naturally monogamous. And if you're monogamous, which I more relate to, then how can I breathe in all the flavors of the feminine and bring it to my partner? And I remember the vision is I'm still a masculine man. I still have primal desires, but what if you had the openness and the possibility for that all to be, to, to get created in a dynamic, like what would it look like if you're like, cause I think as a, as a man, when you're dating or hunting or whatever that looks like, it's more the novelty or the newness of like, what's this situation like? What's, what's the unknown? What's the mystery of what's going to happen? What's the energy? What's the vibe? What's this newness I'm going to learn? What if you could experience that in a partnership where you had total flexibility in each other on boundaries that you guys create together that create safety, but you can play off of that. Like just because somebody has a boundary doesn't mean you can't play around that. Like somebody might say, Hey, we don't play with other partners, but maybe they play with the idea of being the other partners or they, they play around those edges where they still get to experience the experience, but still remain in the boundaries of exploration. And, and I just think, what would the world look like if we were doing that with each other? We were playing yeah. the edges and yeah. still creating safety, right? Or uh, yeah. to your point, self-respect and also mm -hmm. pushing the edges of passion. How mm -hmm. would we get better in our business? How would we get better in our health and vitality? Like how would the rest of our world change if our passion and the, the sexual energy is running through us at a much deeper level. Cause we're vibrant. You see somebody when Very they meet vibrant. somebody new, they're like lit up, right? Like what does yeah. that energy vitality do? And so I want to say something, cause I know it, if I look back in the past, I wasn't as expressed as I am now. And I didn't dare like even utter a fantasy because I just was like, Oh my God, they're going to think I'm sick you know, in my head. And I don't want him to think I'm sick in my head. Like I want him to like me. So I was just like, I can't share these things that I would really like to do because that they're not like what good girls do or whatever. So, you know, there was that phase. And so what I started to do to explore my erotic mind, we all have an erotic mind. It's really healthy to explore your erotic mind. Um, and where I, I started exploring more is where I felt threatened. So bringing in another woman into the relationship freak the hell out of me because I'd had really bad experiences with that of women like coming in, but then stealing my boyfriend and that kind of stuff. So I had a lot of triggers. I was like, I am not open to this at all. So what did I do instead of forcing myself to have the experience again, which would probably be my partner who didn't have enough skills to deal with, you know, settling the system and all of that. I wrote the fantasy. I started writing like, a whole scenario and I would cry and I'd freak out. I'd be living it as I was writing it. But what this does to the erotic mind is it gives permission for these edges to exist and no one got hurt. And I didn't even always share those things with my partner because it was for me. So that's what I mean by solo cultivation. We don't have to wait for it to be okay for someone else or wait to even have a partner or, or any of those things, we can start really discovering those edges. And then, you know, as I evolved and, you know, got to know myself and, and created that safety through self-respect, then I was way more willing to like, at least verbalize something so edgy. I'm like, Oh my God, but it created such intensity mm. and no one disrespected me. We didn't actually have to act it out, but we definitely pretended like we were going to act it out. And that was the edge. So those types of things, I think erotic innocence and really like genuinely exploring what does that mean in your life? How can you express it? And how can you also encourage it in another? So when say a partner would come to me with a fantasy. I'm like, Ooh, tell me more. Even though I know inside, I probably never want to do that, but it's turning them on. So I'm like, tell me more. Like, what about it turns you on? Like what, what's happening? And because it's, it's just erotic mind stuff at this point, it's not actual like physical things going on. I'm still safe. We're just exploring this. It doesn't mean something has to happen. That was the thing that held me back, Joshua, is I didn't express fantasy because I felt like as soon as I would say it, my partner would try and make it happen. Hmm. And I'm like, I'm not saying this because I actually really want it. I'm saying it because it's really hot and I want to explore it, but I don't actually really want that experience. Right. Yeah. I, I love where you're going with this because I, I was very similar. I was suppressed in my desires and my expression. So I would find myself like single and not wanting relationship, it being the guy that was like fun and playful and exploratory. And then when I get into relationship, I would suppress those parts of me because I had judgment on them. And I was almost these two different sides. And um, it was just very like, 
vanilla, I would say for most of my life. And so now learning to be expressive and communicative, I've also shifted the story from feeling it being shameful to like, oh, it's intimacy. Like I realized, like I didn't have a lot of intimacy with partners prior. And now I'm like, there's this whole world that opens up when you have the freedom to go, let's play. Like, what does that play look like? And to your point, if you give yourself permission to express ideas, like you could do a lot with playing with the mind and putting on a blindfold between the two of you, where you create mm -hmm. scenarios and tell each other what's happening in the ear when you're just playing with each other. And it showed me like, there's this whole other world that I was missing out on just yeah. because I didn't know how to communicate or because I had that fear, I would attract people that when I would communicate, I would get rejected because I was in that same dynamic. And still I try to, and still I learn to own and go, this is who I am. This is how I'm yeah. wired and I'm okay yeah. with it. Um, and then communicating it. And I think you, you bring up one other valid point. Like, I think when we're first learning to communicate, it's almost like, this is the way. And it's very rigid because it's been suppressed for so long. We're almost like, this is who I am. And then I think with time, you learn to like slowly introduce and slowly be like, oh, let's have a conversation and like playfully enroll somebody to come with you on the journey yes. um, versus like a rigid black or white, which again, back to the safety, that feels like an ultimatum, like do this mm -hmm. or not. And so I'd say as you're developing, be gentle with yourself, learn to communicate and be expressive. Also learn to like, hey, come make it fun. Like make it, make I, think it my, I think of my, I think of my cat. What's that? Yeah, playful and fun. I mean, the, the thing is that we've done what we've done to sex in our society is we have commoditized it and we have conceptualized it. But very few of us have embodied it, like really like giving ourselves permission to be aroused and not do anything about it is probably the greatest skill set to become an epic lover. Say, say that say that one more time, just so it lands extra strong, because I don't think- yeah, so that. giving ourselves permission to be fully aroused without having to actually act on it, to do something about it, is a tremendous skill set. It's the skill set of being able to handle more and more erotic tension. And then when it's appropriate or whatever, you can utilize that energy in either your business or your relationships, or even just healing yourself, like whatever's going on here. That's really important. We're not sexual doings or sexual beings. And the act of being a sexual being is you're going to be aroused and you're going to be aroused often. And uh, most of the time it's going to be inappropriate. So can you enjoy that arousal and just not do anything about it? Just like enjoy being switched on. You're like, I'm really switched on right now. It's super inappropriate, but that's cool. I'm going to like, you know, <laughs> keep going on with my day rather than self-shaming or shutting down or like having to act on it no matter what and then feeling like you're betraying your agreements or you know whatever's going on in that direction which this boils back down to self-mastery self-respect self-nurture like you know that's a i know a big shift i made i remember i used to be really adolescent in that mindset of like oh no this is the way once i had it in my mind which felt very rigid and and not not very um loving and supportive of myself Right. And I think as, as you evolve, you learn it's more about the connection with yourself. Um, that starts to become much more fun, <laughs> you know, and your connection with who you're connecting with is a very evolved to your point a moment ago. If somebody's really shut down and you're not able to pick that up, like something's not happening. And so how do you communicate that? How do you start to open and um, how do you maybe get some support with that too? Right. Like sometimes we can't figure out ourselves and we need somebody to play like mediator, like, Hey, who could be the medium person to help us make sense of where we're at and where we need to go. But I would say like, this is what we get as a human. I would really encourage anybody that's listening, like to explore if you have beliefs that are shameful or negative or wrong around sex. Like my guess is it may be shadowing out in other areas you don't realize. And how do we explore these and learn to um, master these areas so we can be more in control of whether we do anything or don't do anything, but we're getting that vitality in our body and getting mm -hmm. it directed on, it could be building, um, building your business, serving a community. It doesn't mean you're doing sexual things. You're just using that energy, that vitality to build or to elevate versus destroy um, and be stagnant, you know, and shadow off. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And so the last thing I kind of wanted to say before we go, because I know we're going to go in a minute is the fastest way in the most healthy way to start expanding erotically, evolving erotically, individuating erotically, that's very safe. And it's not going to get you in any trouble 
is to start whether you, whatever, however you orient your gender and your sexuality, I don't care. But every body has a sensuality. And our sensuality is literally how we make sense of reality. That's what sensuality is, how we make sense of reality. So switch it on all the way so that you're making the most sense of reality as possible. Start to accentuate first your dominant senses, but then eventually all of your senses. And so the exercise to build more robust, healthy, erotic connection is say your favorite cup of a hot drink that you like, hot chocolate, coffee, tea, I don't care. Can you really take pleasure from it? Or maybe it's a smell. Can you like let that smell touch you so much it actually arouses you? Because when we start to track the things that induce those states of arousal and pleasure and we start doing it more and more, not only are we rebuilding neural pathways, we're enhancing neural pathways, and then we're actually primed for actual sexual intimacy versus trying to like rev the motor after a really long day of being switched off. So I would say to everyone, start to accept that you're very sensual and start to play with your sensuality and start to accentuate it. And I love all this. And the only other thing I would add just from my own personal experiences is notice things that you may be using to numb. That may mm -hmm. seem like, like for me, porn was one of those things where it's like, oh, I thought I was embodying my sensuality when in actuality, I was kind of desensitizing myself because I was so embedded in that I was missing out on the everyday things of life because it was too too high on that spectrum so mm -hmm. like I would say give yourself a break from the things that aren't are taking you out of life so you can engage more fully with life so if that's mm -hmm. addictions workaholism you know alcohol drugs any of those things that yes. they're taking away from you just notice are they elevating you closer or are they pulling you away um, yeah so I love that so much uh, Joshua and and then I think this will be my last kind of share is it's very easy. So if you take like vital, your aliveness, your life right now, this is how I make decisions. Is this decision I'm about to make, whether it's eating something, engaging in something, create what, I don't care what it is. Is this decision going to enhance my vitality, my aliveness, my being switched on, or is it diminishing it? That's it. That's all we ever have to ask ourselves throughout the day. Is this thing I'm about to do inspiring, gifting me, you know, filling me, all of those things, or is it actually like flatlining me? And we know that because we might go for the little, like say the tasty thing that we really like, but afterwards we feel like crap. That is a no decision. If you're, if you're living your life, uh, just from the, that dynamic, I just explained. I love it. And Hey, the last thing before we go, one, if you're listening to this and it was valuable and you have any questions or you'd like to know other topics to go deeper, just write it in the comments or send myself or Dr. Saeed a, a private message and we'll jump on and do this again if it was useful or go in different directions. And then two, how do they get a hold of you? If people are like, ah, oh, this is amazing or I want to work with you, which I highly recommend. If you're listening and you felt some resonance in your body, reach out to Dr. Saeed, get in one of her programs. So how, how would they get a hold of you? Yeah, dare your desire dairydesire.com is my site. It looks female dominant, which it is. However, I've started to work more with men. I don't have any like obvious programs, um, but I love people. I love, I want to live in a world where people are, you know, expressed and feel alive and feel switched on. I think that's when we're going to start creating some beauty together. Um, so I would love to speak and also social media. You can always just say hi that way. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. Lots of fun. And I know there's a lot of gold nuggets here and you, somebody may need to listen to a couple of times because there was a lot, a lot huh. going here, a lot yeah. of dynamics that show up and a lot. So we went really deep on a couple of subjects, but because this is what a very common thing that shows up and we wanted to give you layers underneath the hood. So thank you so much for joining me. Take the time to share oh, yeah. your wisdom. It's always yeah. so much fun. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a beautiful day. Bye, everybody.